على الدكتورز ومطرح على الستودنتس Okay, we're live. I'm gonna double check. Okay. 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 I'm gonna uh, send me the link. Yeah, the client does the whole five minutes. Yes. But then it's okay. Second thing. I will figure out if we can make special case because I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to Let's keep it on Thank 
You send it to Peter to log in. Yes. Uh, That's better. Oh, okay. 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 Just mute. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna go off. Yes, that's It's 
Hey everyone, we're going to start in one or two minutes. Okay. That time I'll introduce my name. No. <coughs> Hey everyone. Um, part of it I'm going to read from here, part of it I'm going to freestyle. So, everyone, I'm Gregory Nicholas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, and distinguished guests, it's part of it from here. So, I'm Gregory Nicholas. I'm a plastic surgeon from Brazil. I actually studied medicine here in Lebanon. And then afterwards, I did my residency in plastic surgery at the University of Sao Paulo. One of the great professors here from there, too. Some of them are from our colleague university, so it's going to be really nice. And I currently, I'm a junior faculty at the University of Sao Paulo, working in plastic and reconstructive surgery. My focus is in reconstructive surgery there at the faculty. But we will be talking more about different aspects, whether it's aesthetic or reconstructive in that part. But to start, um, Today we'll be starting the first uh, ever, actually, the Lebanese-Brazilian conference between the two countries. And it's a really good collaboration that we're going to start so that medical students can actually get to know how does the Brazilian system work? Is it an opportunity for you guys? And it's a great collaboration. And we've designed this with the different fields and the different aspect of multiple parts of the health system in Brazil and to see how, how does it work in Brazil so you can get to know it more. The, the conference was uh, officially organized by the AMLB. It's a great association of the Lebanese descendants in Brazil. They are a huge amount. I, I think you guys heard that there's 12 million Lebanese there. So more than here, Lebanese descendants. It's under the patronage of the Lebanese Order of Physicians and the International Lebanese Medical Association worldwide and or hosted by the International Transplantal Research one of our main organizers, Melanie, if you guys know her, she helped organize all this with us. So without further ado, I want to extend my warm welcome to Dr. Raul Kutait, the president of the first international Lebanese-Brazilian conference. Please, Dr. Kutait, the podium is yours. Good morning. You are the future. Why are we here? Because uh, we must thank Lebanon to be part of Brazil. 
and we must thank the zoo to have so many Lebanese descendants there. What we know is if we can do something together for health, the health system, this will improve what you guys can do here and will give us in Brazil the chance to be more exposed to the Lebanese way of living. So the idea of this conference that we came from uh, the society whose president is here, Dr. Walid <coughs> and Daddy, is that uh, we have to do something together. We have to work together. And we want you to know what we do in Brazil. But Brazil is not in the root of the medical people from Lebanon. And we like to be included because we believe we have uh, a lot of things to offer you. And this conference is just the very beginning. We have in mind so many other things to do in the near future. And hopefully, Lebanon and Brazil will have high commitments to be, these commitments will be more and more uh, evident, more and more strong. So I uh, welcome all of you and uh, let's uh, start working. So let's start with the national anthem of Lebanon, which is the open of the Serena, student, medical student, and she's going to be presenting Dr. Seraya. Good morning, everyone. Allow me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Suraya Sumir. Dr. Ismail is a preliminary educator of pharmacology, holding the prestigious position of full professor at the Polista School of Medicine, Southern University of Sao Paulo. Her, her exceptional academic journey includes master's and PhD qualification, along with postdoctoral studies at the renowned institution such as Thomas Jefferson University, the National Institute of Health in the USA. Dr. Smaili's international influence extends as she has served as the visiting researcher at the NIH, a visiting professor at the University of Florida, and has held the esteemed Forgotten Foundation Fellow. In addition to her academic prowess, Dr. Smaili was a former director of the University overseeing the university's ascent to prominent ranking among the top universities in Germany. Her leadership extends to various science and technology organizations, including the Science and Technology and Enterprise and the Brazilian Society of the Progress of Science. Moreover, Dr. Smaili plays a vital role in completing research 
the areas of interest of the patient. In context, sepsis being linked, autophagy, neurodegenerative diseases, and lung cancer, making your acquiring and addressing critical health care challenges. We are honored to have Dr. Sudeira Smaili with us today, and her insights are sure to enlighten and inspire us. Okay, uh, good morning, good morning everybody. Sabah al I can start uh, probably um, exercising my Arabic as well because I really like to be here and it's a great, great honor. And I thank you so much for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, I wanted to thank, is it working? Okay, it's so working. It's very kind introduction. Thank you so much. And uh, I have to thank, uh, especially uh, our president Walida Andrei, uh, for organizing this very nice trip and nice uh, meeting uh, to Doctor Raul Kutais for being president of this nice conference. And also uh, Dr. Riyad Yunis for being in the organization of this very nice conference. And this meeting that we hope we are bringing not only ideas or uh, about some information about our work, but also we want to strengthen our relationships. So this is very important, it's very good, and I feel very happy to be, and to see in the audience so many young people here. And I thank you for all the Lebanese organization as well, for bringing all of you to this morning. I hope that we can uh, talk a little bit about our work, recent work, and I know I, have, I don't have much time, but I, I wanted to, to give you some uh, few, few uh, glimpses about what uh, is predictive uh, medicine these days. So I want to talk a little bit about that data science <clears throat> in medicine and how we can use it to predict uh, diseases and diagnosis. So this is a work that I've been developing uh, in, at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, which is uh, a university, is a young university, but we come from a school of medicine called Escola Paulista de Medicina. And uh, also this work is in collaboration with Fio Cruz Foundation, Oswaldo Cruz, which is a very important institution for health science in Brazil. And uh, uh, these are my uh, my appointments here, you can uh, have me on the uh, my CV, the Brazilian CV is also uh, in English, and uh, my Instagram, I'm also in the Instagram, so we can contact each, each other. So, <laughs> this is uh, just a, one slide to show you, sorry, we cannot touch anything. This is just one slide to show you, don't worry, it's just one slide to show you what I'm working actually. Uh, this is what I work actually, autophagy. But autophagy is a very important uh, signaling uh, and you have it in uh, many diseases and it's very important to protection in neurodegeneration, but I'm not going to talk about that, don't worry. So this is the very uh, difficult and uh, detailed uh, uh, slide. But I start my story here today with this picture. This was the visiting of the 
Dr. Andrew Bullard, who is a professor at the University of Oxford, is in the center. Uh, in this picture, we have we also have uh, Dr. Rubens Belfort, who is who was a, a president of the Academy of Medicine in Brazil at that point. I was rector at that point. And also, we had the collaborators and the coordinators of the uh, phase three vaccine, the Oxford vaccine in Brazil. So our university was leading the coordinate, was coordinating actually the studies of phase three studies of the Oxford vaccine in Brazil. So this was an important moment to all of us. And being a rector, it was very strong and uh, also very difficult because uh, we had to organize the whole university, who, which ha has a very big hospital in Sao Paulo, which is a big city, to face and to uh, be uh, facing the COVID-19 in Brazil. So in, at that point, I started to, of course, I was rector, but I am a professor and I am a researcher. And, but I uh, was also thinking how could I help with my research, with my science, how, how could I help to uh, face COVID as well? So we have uh, these questions. And then I became aware that I could help with the data the data that we have in our hospital, which is a big hospital, as I said. So then uh, we asked about uh, artificial intelligence. But before I talk about our data and artificial intelligence, it's important to point uh, that artificial intelligence, intelligence is actually in everything now. So. When we think about a video that we watch in TikTok, we have artificial intelligence. When we talk about Google search, we are talking about artificial intelligence. When we are uh, buying uh, in the Amazon, uh, this is not a propaganda piece, uh, we are talking about artificial intelligence. When we talk about chat, DTP, or Canva design, we are talking about artificial intelligence. So how this artificial intelligence could actually help us in medicine and in medical practice. So the answer is predictive data science is a novel prognosis tool on our work. So we need to talk about that. So this is a, the first and, and important take home message you can get much from much more from your medical records don't throw away don't despise your medical records because you can get many informations and you, information and you can uh, actually decide your uh, procedures being aware of your medical records so before i talk to the uh, about our work again I have a few questions for us. So, will predict prediction uh, done by rich countries work for our patients, for our countries? So, the answer is no. It's important that we do our own research on data science. So, this is an important message. So, how to make predictions from my patients, this is another question. So a good artificial intelligence tool requires tons of data, so don't be afraid because you will have a lot of information. And then you can analyze, extract uh, information from all this data, and then you can uh, make your predictions, your own predictions, so you can organize and you can structure your data. And then, uh, where can I get tons of data from my patients? So, your electronic health records. Ah, but I don't have electronic uh, records. No problem. Your manual records also is important. 
don't throw them away. Keep them and analyze them. There are many tools these days to analyze these records. So the other thing is, can I have a data uh, base for analysis? Can I construct my own database? Yes, we can start, but uh, the second take home message is, is start with a very clear clinical question. Because if you don't have a very clear clinical question, you don't, doesn't matter what tools you have, what uh, tons of data you have, you are not going anywhere. So you have to have a very important and good question, uh, clinical question and research question. So uh, then you start grouping the records and form your own database. And you can use and abuse of artificial intelligence, but do not forget the human eyes. You cannot forget that you have to analyze what you have. Uh, so artificial intelligence can do a lot of things and can do a part of your, the work, but it cannot do everything. So basically what we have is you have tons of papers, medical records, digital records, and then you have to structure this database. So, and you have tools to structure the database. And then you have uh, tons of data from multiple hospitals and you cannot actually do that too. You can structure the whole system if you, of course, spend time and you spend people, you have people doing that and you can extract a lot of information. So basically the steps are here. I'm not going uh, in detail, but you have the steps on uh, gathering data, structuring data, then you extract the data, then you create a system to analyze and to extract the, the words and the, and the information that you actually want to get. So then you can analyze and have some predictive in, uh, medicine. The other step, when you are already structured, you can make linkages and then you can link a few databases and uh, enrich your information. And then you will have more powerful information for your decision. So what was my question coming back to the COVID and to the pandemics? What was my question when I started to look at the, those uh, type of work and research? So it was a thing called long COVID. So after a year, year and a half of pandemics, we started to realize with the medical doctors in our university that there were few patients that were hospitalized and they were coming back, coming back, because there were several uh, symptoms that were not going away. So then we started a, uh, uh, system. Uh, at that time, we didn't know we were going to reach here, but uh, we started a system to learn more about what was affecting those people and what were they, they feeling. <clears throat> later, <clears throat> in that year, <clears throat> sorry, later in that year, we realized those two uh, important publications in 2021, they uh, showed us that, uh, first of all, COVID was a decreasing life expectancy in Brazil. This is a demographic study uh, published in Nature Medicine. And then the other study, was, which was very important, was uh, the, the uh, group of people that uh, uh, study the mechanisms and the risk factors that took us to the long COVID. So this is the review. This is the first review, basically, 
And there are several, several uh, systems affected by COVID. And it doesn't matter how we know if the patient was hospitalized or not. We know that there are several systems that are affected. We have cardiovascular, respiratory system, kidney. Uh, we have uh, the muscles, skeletal muscle. muscle. Uh, we have uh, problems in the gastrointestinal system, problems in the metabolism, uh, diabetes, uh, also cognitive problems. Uh, so it affects the central nervous system. And uh, we have, uh, in many patients, now we know, and we realize that after two years of our work, but other researchers also saw that, that we have uh, especially uh, fatigue and dyspnea is uh, some of the most important system, even after two years of the COVID. So this is, and then we have this important consensus from uh, WHO, and now we are having more clear that uh, low COVID exists. So we basically, I'm not going in details in here, but we create a dictionary of medical condition terms for our records, and then we extract the medical condition terms uh, if you see the numbers, there are more than 2 million and 6,100 notifications. So we have to analyze all of that. We cannot do all by eye or by human eye. We need artificial intelligence to get a, a more, stronger information. And now we know that uh, there are relative risks uh, increased in the population. So especially if a person has one, two, or three comorbidities, and uh, also if the patient was hospitalized for more than 30 days. We also validate this uh, questionnaire with the human eyes, so we have uh, several students working in that now. And also we have some data here showing that there are some, uh, in some of the uh, symptoms are pers persistent even after six months or one year. So we have to pay attention. This is not a disease that we want to catch. So uh, it's important to analyze all of, of, the, of this data. So this is a method. Now we know that our method can be applied to other hospitals, which is also very nice because we are now in a system federal system in Brazil with uh, 42 federal hospitals, and we are trying to uh, implement this method in all these 42 hospitals. These are the next steps. And just to finish this uh, conference, I want to uh, uh, give this last information. This is a very recent work done by Ziad Alali, He's a Lebanese a researcher in the Chicago University. And uh, he's a very nice guy, very young like you. And he's doing a great job with uh, data science. And what he did was he analyzed more than 6 million of patients in the US. And now we have very strong information about uh, long COVID. This is not very clear, but you can take the, the paper. It was published uh, recently in Nature Medicine and other researchers uh, research in other journals too. But this is a very important and remarkable work from uh, Ziad El Ali and his group. So this is a, met a method to structure to take data from hospitals that. Uh, as I said, but you can use it in several other things, not only in data hospitals. You can use in medical records in general. So this is the uh, information that I wanted to bring to you. I thank you so much. This is, uh, I thank all the collaborators. 
Celia, Caio, and Mateus, they are students, medical students in our school, uh, Escola Paulista de Medicina. Ernesto Ravera is a specialist. Uh, the doctors, uh, the clinical doctors that were uh, with us during this study. Uh, and in Fio Cruz, we have uh, the collaboration of all these guys, especially Manuel Barral, who is a very strong uh, uh, and coordinator of the whole system of data science in Brazil. This is something I didn't say, but in Brazil we have now a very strong and powerful system working uh, together with uh, Fiocruz, and we are structuring the data, all the data from SUS, uh, the, the system, the public system in Brazil. And this is, uh, we are hoping that we can contribute not only with uh, science, but also with uh, our education, as well as with collaborators. So come to Brazil, you have, uh, we will be very happy to have you there. Thank you so much. It's great being here. Thank you a lot, Professor, for this uh, lecture. Does anyone have any questions for Professor? Yes. Very nice presentation, Professor Smiley. Very, very nice. I could uh, like ask you we are here in Lebanon. Do you think in this the system that you have in Brazil, that we have in Brazil, is it possible to set it in Lebanon or is it very expensive or is it impossible? What, what can you tell these young people here? What, what can they do here? Thank you so much, Dr. Yunis. Very great. Uh, a very good question, actually, because that's what I wanted to show, that you don't need to have a structured data. You can start from scratch. You can start from nothing. Because our system, uh, our hospital is called Hospital São Paulo. Uh, hospital São Paulo. So uh, Hospital São Paulo is a very big hospital, 80 years old. The, uh, from the medical records, the digital medical records, is a mess, <laughs> I can tell, because it was built along the years. It, it is not the commercialized ones that you have in the market. So that's why uh, we started to organize this data, because we needed to structure the data, so you have to gather the data to organize with the uh, powerful tools that you have. You don't need to buy them, the tools. There are free tools for data science. And you can structure your data, and then you can start to organize and have analysis. You can extract what you want, not only for long COVID. This is something that I didn't say. Uh, it was too fast, but you can do it for cancer, you can do it for diseases that you don't know, that you don't understand, and you need to don't have more information. So sometimes you have years of records, and you have powerful information there, and you have to extract this information and analyze. So this is very powerful. You don't need a big lab, you don't need a big uh, system, and all of you, especially the young people, they can do it uh, in a blink. So it's, it's very, very powerful. So this is the, the, the take home message that I wanted to give you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. I think a uh, uh, capital one. And that means uh, the kind of medicine that we've been doing till now will be completely different from now on because of uh, IA. And then people here will have to practice something different that we do. They're going to have more guidelines to follow, they're going to have more. Uh, uh, Evaluation of what they were, they were doing and less freedom, maybe, to do whatever they want to do as doctors. So, in other words, 
all of us, the doctors, are going to be a real part of a big data system. And this is good in one sense because it will help people who doesn't know too much to make better decisions. On the other hand, we're going to be a little bit tied up to do whatever you think we should be better. So I would like you to comment on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Park. Uh, that's, that's true. We are, uh, in a certain way, there are a whole new world opening for all of us, especially for the young people. And uh, we have uh, many things we can uh, get from this data science. But of course, there are limitations. And in my opinion, the most important uh, limitation, which is not a limitation actually, is something that we need to uh, keep in mind. It, it doesn't, I, as I said before, it doesn't matter what tool you have. You can have a very strong tool for artificial intelligence. You can have bigger information, big, very good scientists, but you need to have the a very good question first. You need to know what to look for, what you are looking for. Because it doesn't matter if you have uh, tons of data and uh, very good specialists, if you don't know where you want to get. And second one, you need the human eyes. So when we checked in our study here for long COVID, we started, uh, we had millions of data, millions of sheets of, of of forms, because they are forms, several ones. And how to, so we gather that, okay. But we extracted the symptoms because we were looking, we had, we had a list of symptoms and we extracted the symptoms that we wanted to study. But then we needed to check if the system was working fine. Then we needed the specialists and the students and the, everybody to look to the data and see if they were making sense. So it doesn't matter if we have all the machines, if we don't have the human intelligence. <laughs> so it's uh, AI, but also HI. So we need the human intelligence to, to make uh, sense. So I think this is the challenging thing because some people think that we Chat GTP, GTP, you can solve everything. No, you cannot solve because you can ask questions to the chat GTP. And if you don't have the critis, criticism or the critical mind to look to this data and see if it's right or wrong, what you can do. So thank you so much. That's, uh, I think this is a good thing and important thing that we need to think about and uh, good reflection. Thank you so much. Thank you, Architecture. And I hope everybody uh, accepts the invitation that the professor referenced in your field so you can get us out there and get to know more about it. Uh, starting with our first module, which is a very hard topic to answer, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Jana Jalbut here. She's going to be presenting Professor Yard, who's the coordinator of the content of the, the module. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. It is a pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Yard Yunes a distinguished figure in the field of thoracic surgery and an esteemed associate professor of surgery at the prestigious University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Dr. Yunus completed his medical education at the University of Sao Paulo and underwent extensive training in general and thoracic surgery. His pursuit of excellence led him to the prestigious Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, USA, where he completed his fellowship, further honing his skills in surgical oncology. Throughout his career, Dr. Yunus has held respected academic and administrative positions, including being an honorary professor at the University College of London 
and has played key roles in prominent medical institutions in South Africa. Currently, he serves as the general director of the hospital Alimo Oswaldo Food Cancer Center. Dr. Yunus is a dedicated researcher focusing on lung cancer and neuroendocrine tumors, with an impressive publication record of over 150 scientific papers and 20 medical books. His dedication to surgical innovation, oncology, and medical education has made him a respected leader in the field of medicine. He has consistently demonstrated a commitment to advancing the boundaries of surgical science while nurturing the next generation of medical professionals. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yunus to the stage as he shares his valuable expertise in the field of lung cancer. Good morning, everyone. Sabah uh, I hope you are enjoying this, uh, this meeting. And uh, we will start this module on lung cancer. And thank you again for the for the Nas presentation. Uh, this module is a very complicated module. It's, uh, it's a very dense, and we will try to speak very fast to be able to convey to you what we do in Brazil, how, how, how we think, what, what kind of research we are doing, and how things are, are evolving in our country. And for this, we will have first, uh, in the first module, three presentations, and we will uh, we'll be happy to to invite uh, Professor Douglas Rassi. Douglas is the, uh, he is the head of radiology and imaging department at the Hospital Benicista uh, Portuguesa in Sao Paulo, just for you to have an idea. Hospital Benicista Portuguesa is one of the biggest hospitals in Latin America. It, 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 it's the home of over 2,800 deaths. It's a huge hospital. And he's the head of the of imaging, of imaging at that hospital. And he will try to convey to you what kind of uh, work we do there and how we advance uh, cancer treatment in that hospital. Professor Lassi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. I'm very happy to be here in Beirut, uh, the city of my, my mother. And I just talk about image oncology. Uh, a huge uh, end to the talk, but I try to So I divide this lecture in CT scan, MRI, and PET scan. Education, in some case, this lecture only shows case. Okay. First, about CT scan, uh, is a no invasive imaging test. It is the combination of X-ray equipment with programmed computer capable of producing better high quality image of internal organs. By combining the image of multiple X-rays, this exam offers a much more detailed study than a common radiography. It is used to study different parts of the body and can diagnose different tumors. So let's start with some examples. Here we can see uh, okay, point, uh, if you have pointed, no, no problem. Let's go without pointer. But here in the computer, you can see up uh, down, you can see an x-ray left side, uh, a man we we use you see. Uh, bilateral opacity in the higher region. Oh, thank you. Oh, very nice. Thank you very much. Here, at ray and here, another patient. Look here. Bilateral opacity, higher region. And CT scan, you can see very well the lymph node in the higher region, bilateral and subcardinal. 
this is that we got. Another side, remember this case, but different because we can see a mass in the pre vascular mediastina. So, this case, the lymphoma looks at gray, outline, uh, smooth outline. So, this is a lymphoma, remember, cyclidose. Okay. Another case, a man with invasive fibroma, look at the mass, here in the pre vascular mediastinal red arrow, and here you can see a drop metastasis in pleura. So, this represents a tymoma, invasive tymoma. Look for a plan. You can see with the computer tomography a uh, drop metastasis in pleura. So, we staging for A. Here, with CT scan, it's very nice to detect sometimes a cancer inside the stomach. Look here, a nodule, hypervascular nodule. So, this is a gastric neuroendocrine tumor, coronal plan. You can see the lesion, and here you see a little nodule in the right lobe of the liver. So this is the metastasis. Computer is very good test and computer scan to detect a small lesion. So here an example, a human with a hypervascular bottle in the head of the pancreas. Look at the image, a good image with CT scan. It, uh, multiple images, you can see the right side, a hypervascular nodule, and here the lesion. So, look here, maybe the same case, no, this is a different case. This is a cleft artery anomaly. Look at uh, MIP, coronal plan, the uh, splenic artery, and the uh, anomaly. So, different case, maybe the same, but different. Learning the prime tumor, and here, splenic artery. Another case is a bad case. A man is 55 years old, and look here the mass encasement, the upper mesenteric artery. So, encasement greater than 180 degrees. So, this is a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. It's impossible to make a surgery here because encasement the upper mesenteric artery. Another different case, uh, a lot of nodule, hypervascular nodule, through the pancreas, throughout the pancreas. So this is a nephrectomy in man with nephrectomy because he had a cancer, renal cancer. So this is a metastasis, renal metastasis from uh, renal cancer. Another case, a city pancreatic tumor, the histologic is a serious the denoma, look at the mass in the head of the pancreas, and an interesting case, you can see a cystic disease and calcification inside of the mass. So, this is a woman, 85 years old, old woman, remember, old woman, when you see this mass, this represents serous cystic adenoma. <clears throat> and here, a woman about 50 years old, so, a mass, cystic mass in the tail and body of the pancreas. So, there's no cystic adenoma. This is a mucinous cystic pancreatic tumor. Woman about 50 years old. And here, a man with CT scan, interductal papillar mucinous neoplasia. Look here, the cystic lesion. And here, the secret is the cystic lesion. There is a communication with the man pancreatic duct. When you see the communication, remember interductal papillar muscle. Here, example of woman of cancer. This is very nice uh, to understand. CT scan, look at the mass, calcification mass around the spleen and around the liver, coronal plant, axial plant. So this is a low grade serious adenocarcinoma. And calcification represents sebomatose calcification, typically the disease of ovarian cancer. Another example, a woman again, ovarian cancer, but muscinol. This is the uh, lipogenin. Look here, between the liver and the renal. This is a uh, peritoneal pseudomic stoma in the epidermal recess here around the liver 
and allow around the spleen. So ovarian cancer, peritoneal cell myxoma, but mucinous disease. Look at this liver in CT scan, a nodule in the left a lot of the liver, but we can see a fat inside the nodule. So this represents hepatic angiomyelitoma. And here the same lesion, but different place in the kidney. So this is a renal angiomyelitoma. Look at the coronal plant, the mass with fat angiomyelitoma. This case, a man, a chronic alcoholic, chronic alcoholic, you see the liver, irregular shape, typical surrounded by CT scan. And look at the lesion, hypervascular nodule, arterial phase, and here, part of phase and late phase. What happened? Wash out hypervascular and now hypervascular. So it's typical carcinoma. It's not necessary to make biopsy. A young man, 28 years old, duodenal ulcer. Look here, X-ray, two lesions, red circle, a nodule in the lung, and green circle, a nodule a near the hyalur region. So lymph node and cancer gland. <clears throat> and this young man, look here, the liver. A lot of disease uh, throughout the liver. So this metastatic disease and here the primary tumor, the triangle of gastrinoma between effort collateral, duodenal, and pancreas. Here, triangle of gastrinoma. Look at the primary tumor and metastatic disease. Young man. So another uh, machine is MRI, magnetic resonance image is a diagnosed exam image exam, which does not have radiation and allows the capture of the tail and three-dimensional image in a no invasive way. State of the art technology, it's used to stimulate and detect the change in direction of the axis of rotation of the protons found in water that make up living tissue. These molecules are captured by the resonance device and reproduced in the computer to evaluate the result obtained. So the first example, MRI, a woman and sagittal plan. You can see here a mass sagittal plan in the uterus. Look here, it serves a mass and here white represents gel inside the vagina to better image, okay? Tip two image, you see the mass in the service, and here T1 image, the mass, high frequency signal, and here diffusion MRI, there is a restriction. So this is the epidermoid carcinoma of service. This woman, look at the problem. There is a lot of peritoneal carcinoma tosal. Look at the mass in the peritoneal. T1 image, T2 image, and pelvic disease. Look here, the mass peritoneal carcinoma. Another case, MRI is very nice to see the nodule in the adrenal. And this technique, the name is Gradienti Echo. In phase and out of phase. Out of phase, I can see the black image. So this represents a micro fat inside the lesion. Micro fat inside the lesion is adenoma, okay? It's not necessary to make biopsy. Here, an example, bilateral disease in adrenal, since adrenal, femtromocytoma, bilateral, the man with arterial hypertension, okay? And here, MRI, and we, we use a compress, the name is gadolinium, okay? A case with gadolin in the mass. MRI is very nice to detect prostate cancer. So, multi-parametric MRI of prostate. T2 women, you can see the nodule. Diffused MRI, you can see the nodule restriction. And here, gadolin and Kaysman deletion. Sometimes we use whole body MRI to detect metastasis disease. 
Look here, an example, a nodule, the left side of the peripheral zone, prostate gland. This is a cancer. Normal, and here the cancer. The first biopsy, stump, prostatic stromal tumor of certain malignant potential. Repeat biopsy, and look common adenocarcinoma is subgrade 3. Another example, but different. Now, stadium T3A, because there is extension, extracapsular extension of the capsular, prostate capsule, and here tumor invasion. <clears throat> here, a man PSA about 22, glycerol 4 plus 4. You can see the nodule, the left side of the peripheral zone, so inside the prostate. So this is the 2B stadium. And here, perfusion. Look at the tumor, a head tumor. Here, you can see very well with gadolin perfusion MRI of prostate. And MRI is very nice to study seminal vesicles. Look here, normal vesicles. And here, a tumor inside the seminal vesicles left side. So the stadium T3. And MRI is very nice to study bone. Look here, MRI of lumbar spine and pelvis metastasis. You can see T1 images, a large nodal hypotensive signal throughout the vertebral body. And here, bone of pelvis metastasis disease. This case, another pancreatic adenocarcinoma for the different case here, MRI. You can see the mass in the head of the pancreas, hyperintensive signal, and caveman the, uh, and both the upper mesenteric artery, so unresectable tumor. It's impossible to make surgery. And here, cholangial MRI, you can see the obstruction. Uh, man, pancreatic duct, and here, stop obstruction because there is a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Sometimes we use another contrast. The name is hepatobiac agents. The name is primovist or aovist. So this contrast is very nice to detect metastasis disease. A woman, a female with neuroendocrine tumor in the digestive system. Follow up, you can see small liver lesion. Look here, difficult to detect a metastasis and with hepatobiac agents, you can see a little small lesion throughout the liver, so represent metastatic, metastatic disease. Another patient, cirrhosis, hepatitis C, you can see uh, another hypervascular region and wash out again, hypervascular arterial phase and wash out uh, late phase or hepatobiliar phase. This is hepatocarcinoma, it's not necessary to make biopsy. A man with metastatic melanoma, look at the mass inside the orbit, right orbit, this is melanoma, choroid, and here, a lesion, a lot of small lesion, so hyper intensive signal throughout the liver because there is a bleeding inside the metastatic. And finally, PET scan is a test that should uh, produce high quality images in the body by combining positive emission tomography technology with computer tomography. The great advantage of this hybrid method is obtaining metabolic and atomic information in the same study, providing greater diagnosis accuracy, a radiopharmaceutical use in the procedure, a substance that facilitates the observation of tissues in order. When absorbed by the cell, the material emits radiation which is captured by the device and transformed into an image. So you can see here the PET scan, MIP, and computer tomography. So MIP plus computer tomography, you can see a fusion image, molecular functional plus anatomical morphology. So we can use a different radio pharmaceuticals. We can use FBG, fluoroxidicose, the most common and rather pharmaceuticals in oncology. So if you have a neonatocrine tumor, you use gallium dotatoc. When you have a cancer, prostate cancer, you use PSMA, gallium cyclidase. And you have a breast cancer, 
positive uh, estrogen receptor, you use a phase through estradiol radiopharmaceutical. Very tasty. So here an example, Hodgkin lymphoma. Look, uptake, how hot uptake in the neck, in the mediastinal, axillary, rect peritoneal, and bone pelvis. Another example, oropharyngeal tumor, tonsillar region. You can see a lymph node here, uptake, and after immunotherapy, complete response. I need to run, but the time is finished. And another example here, a tissue around the esophagus and uptake. So middle third of esophagus. So it's a spindle cell carcinoma. And here, distal third of esophagus. This is a dental carcinoma. Another example, GIS, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, a mass inside the stomach, uptake and metastatic disease throughout the liver. So that's clear. The most common uh, cancer in women, malignant cancer, high-grade serious ovarian cancer, adenocarcinoma, look at the mass around the liver, here the mass, uptake, PET scan, sagittal plan, the mass is the pelvis, high-grade serious adenocarcinoma, and the problem is here, this module inside the liver or around the liver. Inside the liver, stadium four, it's impossible to make surgery. Around the liver, stadium three, I can't make seat reduction. So I think that around the liver, and we were right, stadium three, and make a seat reduction. This is an example, Gary Dora talk, a neuroendocrine tumor in the mid group, PET scan Gary Dora talk. And here, PSA may. Uh, PET scan to cancer prostate. You can see through a uh, uh, vertebral bar, metastatic disease, PSMA PET scan. To finally, I would like to show you a lot of disease PET scan, PSMA, a met PSA 11, BSO 9, 4 plus 5. Look at the metastatic disease throughout the bar, lymph node liver, so a uh, bad case, can say about 11. To finish, uh, additional information about chemotherapy, molecular tar therapy, and immunotherapy. One minute, I finish the lecture. Chemotherapy, there is a cytotox action. So cellular damage. Look at the mass, pulmonary cancer, and with chemotherapy, volumet reduction. Monad charge therapy. There is a cytostatic action, blocking of signaling pathways. In matinib, this metastasis in liver, so blocking signal pathway, the mass became sick, so complete response. And immunotherapy, Nobel Prize of Medicine, James Addison, at a super honor. So the question is immunotherapy, if you need you see the mass type, melanoma in type, the size 1.5 plus 2.0, and normal abdomen. In this, you start the, chemo, the immunotherapy, it didn't matter. The mass increase, increase the size. So, progressive disease, no, wait and repeat the test. Repeat the test, disappear the lesion. So, pseudo, pseudo progression disease. Very interesting. Look here, clinical example. Melanoma starts immunotherapy. Oh, increase the lesion. No, cell the progression and after complete response. So, uh, to conclude, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention and dedicate this class to my mother who was born in Scotland and died last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lassie. Thank you very much for this presentation for our young students to see the possibilities of imaging in cancer. Uh, we have a minute, uh, Douglas. We have a minute for questions. If uh, anybody wants to make any any question, no. Okay, Douglas. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, so I will try to uh, as fast as possible to tell you what are the research, what are the results that we are having in Brazil together with other centers in the world for advancement of lung cancer. You have here a huge amount of lung cancer. Most of the people here are smokers. So it's very really nice for you to have attention, focus a little bit on lung cancer. We use as surgeons to operate on lung cancer whenever it's possible. This is the only option that we had. But nowadays, things are changing and changing very fast. So you will see where we are now in lung cancer, uh, in resectable uh, lung cancer. Uh, these are my, my conflicts of interest disclosure. So the, the question here, when to operate? It's not anymore a question of technique. It's not if the surgeon can take it out. So things change a lot. These are the, this is the staging. I know that most of you will already have um, uh, seen these before. They are changing. Three weeks ago, we have a new staging system. It's changed already again and again. Every two years, we have a new one. But mostly, we look at the size of the tumor, if it invades anything. But one of the most important things for the surgeon and for the clinician, the take care of patients know if the lymph nodes are affected, yes or no. This is the main issue nowadays mm -hmm. in lung cancer, with lung cancer. We have several ways to access the lymph nodes in the mediastinum and the hilum. We have the mediastinum and the stenoscopy. We have the video thoracoscopy or robotic surgery, if you, if you like it. We have the ultrasound, endoscopic ultrasound, and we have also the uh, the aspiration here, five needle uh, biopsy of any lymph node. So nowadays we need to know the status of every lymph node in order to make any decision. So you will see that when you will be practicing as medical students, as doctors, things will be very different from what we do nowadays. So the second question is how to operate. So we know the patient is operable, no lymph nodes uh, positive, no metastasis, so how we operate. And nowadays we have the uh, marketing of many techniques, robotics and something else, but mainly, mainly nowadays, most of what we do is video thoracoscopic operations. Robotic operations in the lung are not that uh, game changers. So we don't, it's not like in prostate cancer, so we can, uh, we don't have to try to get operations that is very, very expensive, and uh, the results are mainly the same. You will see here that we have the video assisted surgery. It's like a video laparoscopy, but it's in the thorax, so it's a video thoracoscopy or the video assisted thoracoscopy. Nowadays, this is, it gets better results than, than the usual open thoracotomy with less aggr aggressive uh, operation, and at the same time, the patient gets well very fast and goes back home or to his social activities very fast. Nowadays, most of our patients, when we do the lobectomy, take part of the lung, lobectomy, they go home between the third and the fourth day after the operation, so it's very fast. And uh, since 2015, uh, thoracoscopy is now the standard of care in lung cancer everywhere in the world. This is what we do. And we know that it, it's it's less pain, so it's less painful for the patient. And we have a study that shows immediately after the operation, the patients have significantly less pain and they use less opioid in the operation. And then came robotic surgery. Robotic, robotic is very, it's a very trendy uh, operation. We have robots in our hospitals, but but it doesn't make any difference in lung cancer. Lung cancer, we do the operation with fetal thoracoscopy even faster than with, with, with robotics, and we don't get anything different. And you will see here with the study of the 2,700 patients that we were part of the study, and we didn't, we didn't show any significant, as you mentioned, the lack of convincing study to validate as, uh, as uh, very beneficial, really beneficial technology for lung cancer. But something else is different. So nowadays, we are waiting for data. Uh, we are doing studies in Brazil also to see if there is any area 
in lung cancer operations like robotic surgery will be will be interesting. Up to now, if you do video thoracoscopy, it's more more than fine. And in a country like Lebanon with the economical crisis, we think that you you should stick to video thoracoscopy. It's cheaper, it's faster than robotic. With the standard st staging during the operation, how many lymph nodes? You will see patients, parents, relatives of yours that are operating with lung cancer. Nowadays, if the lung cancer operation doesn't get into the pathology report, it's not important what the surgeon says. Is the, if the pathology report doesn't have at least six lymph nodes in the mediastinum, this operation is not considered appropriate. So we need to be sure that our patients, the few patients that have the opportunity of having lung cancer operation will have an adequate operation. And lymph node, if an anectomy, the resection of lymph nodes with the mediastinum is very, very important. So if you want to see the quality of the lungs, uh, lung cancer surgeon, you look at the lymph nodes, lymph node numbers and quality of lymphadectomy in the mediastinum in, in, in the pathology report. It doesn't make it any difference if you have more than the six lymph nodes or, left, uh, or six lymph nodes or 10 lymph nodes, 15. As long as you get five lymph nodes or more, it's more than enough to get the patient a very nice uh, operation and the best uh, long term survival rate. So, the recommendation here is you have at least six lymph nodes everywhere in the world. So, I hope you, as a quality control in your time in this country, to, to make sure that your surgeons get at least six lymph nodes in every in every uh, specimen, and we see here that lymph node uh, analysis you have minimums. People are trying to get the minimum above six uh, six lymph nodes, but nowadays we are still sticking with the six lymph node number. Okay, this next the next question is if you look at breast cancer and Dr. Mauricio will show you later on. How you operate it. Uh, now, you, the operation for, lung, for breast cancer is very, very conservative. We take just small portions of the, of the breast. So, why don't, don't we think the same way in the lung? So, lung surgeons in Brazil and everywhere in the world are studying, uh, we are doing research to see if we can decrease the size of the operation. We are, we are uh, taking care of patients that are smokers, they don't have good hormonal reserve. So if we can decrease the size of the parenchyma that we take out of the patients, that would be very interesting. So we did a lot of studies in Brazil uh, with, the, with Japan and the United States, and to see if lobectomy, this is the standard treatment, to take one lobe of the lung where the, where the tumor is, or smaller operations for tumors that are smaller in size. And we see that it doesn't make any difference. Nowadays, if you have the tumor less than two centimeters in size and no lymph nodes positive, you have to check the lymph nodes all the time. That's what's very important. You can decrease the size of the, the lung that you take out. So we do a wedge operation or segmentectomy, just a segment, not the whole lung or the whole lobe. So nowadays, we, we know that limited resection could be feasible for patients that have Good prognosis, prognosis, uh, prognostic tumors. So, but anyway, if you take just a tiny, small uh, portion of the lung, a wedge resection, or a segmentectomy, or a lobectomy, whatever you do, you have to get the lymphadenectomy to make sure that the, there is no microscopic metastasis in the mediastinum or the heart. So, always we have to have adequate evaluation of. His Majesty, what we say, the lymph node. When to operate? This is now the big question in lung cancer. We have the operation, we have the patient. We can take the patient, the tumor out. Should we do it upfront, or we have to do something else before? And this, we can we can think about it like the substitution of the operation. For example, radiation oncology now is very very effective in killing tumor cells, so in, in the lung. So we have now, instead of the operation for patients that cannot withstand the operation clinically, they are not healthy enough, we can do uh, the radiation, radiotherapy. 
So we can do what we call the stereotactic radiation oncology, radiation radiotherapy. It's a very, very precise, high dose of radiation to the tumor, low dose of radiation for the, the, the surrounding normal tissue. So we can get very interesting results. So even though the, upper, in the, upper, the surgery is still the standard, but some patients that cannot get surgery, we still can cure a few of them. And here we have five years survival here. Over one third of the patients will be surviving five years or more just with radiation. And things are changing very fast. In Japan, nowadays, no patient above 75 years old is getting operation anymore. Everybody's getting radiation therapy. So things are changing fast. This is instead of the operation. And then we have the operation. And now chemotherapy, immune therapy, and targeted therapy is the standard treatment for patients with locally advanced lung cancer. And then the question, we give chemotherapy, immune therapy, or targeted therapy before the operation, or we do the operation first, and then depending on the pathology, we give them the chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or targeted therapy afterwards. So we have studies that show that adjuvant after the operations works fine, very well, and here you will see, very interesting, this is patients that had only the operation, and these are patients that had, uh, that had treatment after the operation, adjuvant therapy, and we'll see that PA patients will get advantages and benefits from systemic therapy after the operation, not only the operation. So nowadays, it's very rare for us to do an operation and nothing else afterwards. So chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or, or targeted is now the uh, the the almost all of the standard treat so here we have also radiation therapy after the operation it's not that effective but it helps a few patients to give them better control so now we do the operation and afterwards we sit all together on call medical oncologists the surgeon radiation oncologist and and uh, the imaging people and pathology and we try to discuss case by case if just the operation is enough we have to do something else to get the patient better prognosis. So this is what we say for every or everybody here in Lebanon. You have to get your, your the multidisciplinary tumor discussions before and after any operations for lung cancer for any patient in your hospital. The decision is not only for the surgeon, only for the oncologist. All together, they have to take it together. So this is a targeted therapy for mutated EGFR resected lung cancer, you will see something very interesting. This is with no targeted therapy. This is the survival curve. And this is the survival curve if you give them uh, targeted therapy. So this uh, um, selected, selected group of patients will almost double their chances of, of, of living for five years or more after the operation. And nowadays, we can get almost 95% of the patients alive five years or more with targeted therapy after the operation, compared with 40 or 50% after without the target. So things are changing a lot. You have to be more optimistic about lung cancer treatment. This is this is with immune therapy, the same thing. We have huge benefit after the operation if you select well your patients. And then what 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 are the, the odds of doing better operations after getting chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or, or target therapy dependent on the patient? What we call neoadjuvant before the operation treatment. So nowadays, these, these are very recent studies. We get immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. The patient is resectable. We don't do this for patients that the surgeon thinks that doesn't, the surgery is not possible. We give them immune therapy plus chemotherapy before the operation and see what happens. The number of patients that have pathologically complete response, no tumor cell available with after the operation, the pathologist cannot see any viable tumor cell in the, in the, in the, in the patients. You have almost one, four, one fourth of the patients will have no tumor left after the operation. And this is, this is for thoracic surgery, this is unbelievable. We never saw this before. So two years ago, we had these beautiful studies done in Brazil and somewhere else and everywhere else, showing that we can increase the likelihood of 
killing all the tumor cells in the, in the, in the lung, and also if there are any metastases that we, we can't see, they might be dead. Are we sure about this? Like, look what happens. Patients that have immuno and chemotherapy before the operation, they live significantly more with less metastases when they are adequately operation, uh, operated afterwards. So nowadays, most of the centers in the world are shifting into giving the patient chemo or chemo immuno, uh, immuno or target therapy before the operation, and they will get the patient two to three months later to the very uh, complete resection. And usually you will get several patients, almost a fourth of the patients with no tumor left in their lung. So what are the questions that we still have are answering in Brazil, in, in, uh, in our research now, in our centers and at the universities uh, around Brazil? We have all these unanswered still questions. What do we do with co uh, complete responses after the new algebra? So we have new algebra, complete response, what do we do? We don't do anything else, we give them more chemo afterwards, we increase the lack of killing metastasis and see metastasis. What do we do with partial responses? You have the, the tumor, it responded, but it's not completely responded. Give them more chemo, more immuno, or we stop here, we give them radiation therapy, we wait for metastasis and then we treat them, we have no idea. What's the role of liquid biopsy? I will tell you later on about liquid biopsy, is something that's, that's arriving on the, in the market to see cells and DNA that are circulating in the blood. If we don't see anything in PET scan, CT scan, MRI, and if there is something in the blood circulating, is this a sign that we will have to treat these patients or not? Or more, or not? We have no idea nowadays to treat occult disease. What's the treatment role of adjuvant after new adjuvant? We have no idea. Do we do robotic surgery for everybody or just for some patients? We have no idea. Radiation oncology plus chemotherapy, is it better than radiation oncology alone as, as a treatment, as the sole treatment for cancer? And new adjuvant therapy for locally advanced tumor. Nowadays, we don't treat locally advanced tumor with operations. With new adjuvant therapy, this, the tumor shrinks. Can we increase the size of the operations? We have no idea about the, all this, but these are the studies that are ongoing, and I hope one of you or more of you will join us in Brazil to help us with these studies to answer all these questions. Thank you very much. We have time for questions? Yes, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, there is a question. Second row, please. Thank you so much, Professor Yard. It was an excellent lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm a bit far from this. I'm a dermatology resident, but it's very impressive to see how far the field has come and how much it has changed over time. Uh, my question for you is. Uh, in your personal experience, like we're seeing all these amazing numbers about survival and response to treatment, but you've been practicing for years. So in your personal experience, how have you seen the field reflect on the actual prognosis of the patient? How has it affected your practice? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for kind uh, words. It's, uh, you're absolutely uh, right. Things are changing very fast and we are changing with them. So nowadays, there is not, you know, not even one single patient nowadays with lung cancer that is deemed resectable, that we don't discuss it all together with the team, with it, what we call the tumor board. And the pathology is, is, a, is, a, is a, you are a pathologist. Dermatology. So you will see that if dermatology will have tumors, and the discussion shifted. Five years ago, the discussion was, they were asking me, Riyadh, can you take this tumor out? I don't tell them yes or no. And if it's yes, I go to the operation room and operate the patient, and that's it. Nowadays, things are changing. We are discussing now how we can get the tumor out. This is important. But then, how can we give the patients many things? One of them, better survival rate. Then, better survival with no disease. But it's not only 
good for you to survive. You have to survive with no metastasis or no tumor. Third, what kind of quality of life you will have? So if you have a smoker nowadays and you go to operate on this patient, you take half of this lung out. Usually these patients, they will be bedridden, they will be at home, they cannot even walk. Because so technology, reducing the size of the tumor, reducing the size of the operation, radiation therapy, we are giving patients better survival, better quality of life, and nowadays even lesser time taking treatments. But what will happen, I will show you in the next lecture, that this is the cost of this is getting very, very high. One of our main obstacles now, how to get these very expensive treatments, unfortunately very expensive, to the right patient at the right time. So you, as you see, not everybody will enjoy benefit. So in dermatology, in melanoma, and lung cancer, you have to choose very well. So now what we are doing, we are changing our practice in cancer, lung cancer, one of them, is we, do, we, we have now the saying is selection, selection, selection. If you don't select well the patient, you will operate patients with, with no benefit, or give them with no benefit. This is what we are doing now. It's changing, changes a lot. Professor Renat. Yeah, thank you very much. Great talk. We enjoyed very much your presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the cost of this treatment, the target uh, treatment. I would like you to expand on that. Maybe, uh, I don't know, in Brazil it's way expensive. So maybe here it could be even more. Can you talk something, elaborate something about that? I, I, I alluded to this. Thank you, Professor Renato. It's, it's, a, it's a big challenge nowadays. In Lebanon, I mean, Brazil also, but in Lebanon definitely, this is a challenge. So you, you will see. Let, let me tell you something. Um, Adjuvant, adjuvant targeted therapy, the average cost per month for three to four weeks, what we call a cycle, it's around five to thousand, six thousand dollars every month. And it takes sometimes one up to two years to finish the treatment. Think how expensive this is. So this is expensive in Lebanon, this is in the United States, it's expensive here. So the discussion here is how to do it. Um, let me tell you what we are doing at our at our hospital in in uh, in Saint Paul, at uh, uh, the two hospitals that I am practicing now, the Sigmaringen Hospital and the the, the German Osvaldo Cruz. What we are doing now, we have contracts with the pharmaceutical industry and the hospital. So we sit down and we tell them, well, let's share the risk. We know that if we give the chemotherapy or immunotherapy or the target therapy before the operation and the patient doesn't have a good response, as you see, one fourth of the patients will have excellent response, half of them will have good response, but half will have no response. So let's share the risk. We give them the immunotherapy, $5,000 every, every month for two to three months. If there is no response, we don't pay for the immunotherapy. We don't pay the, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company. Okay. If there is a response, then they receive the money. So they share the risk. This is something that Lebanon could work. So if the pharmaceutical company tells you, get immunotherapy now, but there is no response, the patient, the government, the insurance doesn't pay the bill. So this is something that we do now. So it's extremely expensive. So first and second, we select. We, we have the pathology, department at our hospital is now the, the most important part of the hospital. They have to tell us which patients will benefit for any of these treatments, not give them to everybody. Here in Lebanon, I see patients, I see patients here sometimes, and they get everything all the time. So, they, and, and it's very expensive and it's not working, it, it will not work. Maybe because there is a lack of tests, or it's very difficult to get the test, or it's very expensive to get the test, it's more expensive to get, uh, uh, treatment with no benefit. So we select and we try to to reduce the cost. But as I, as you said, uh, it's very very expensive. It's extremely expensive nowadays. We we we, we nobody can afford. Not even the United States can afford this kind of of uh, of cost. So we are trying to select and to reduce the cost, sharing the cost with the pharmaceutical companies. Yes, please. 
Hello, hello, doctor. My name is Mustafa. Um, I have a question regarding the treatment modalities that we talked about regarding lung cancer. Um, new adjuvant chemotherapy and then doing surgery. Is it other data for uh, patients that are relapsed or non-relapsed? And if not, what's the status for patients that do relapse after taking these treatments? Very good question. Yeah, obviously, not everybody will, will be living with no relapse. We have relapse. And then this is another 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 complicated issue. If we have a relapse after new adjuvant immunotherapy or new adjuvant therapy, uh, what do we do with this patient? We discuss it all together with the with the, with the medical oncologist, and we retest the tumor. We re biopsy the tumor, the, the relapsed tumor. So if the patient relapses after the operation and the and the adjuvant or new adjuvant treatment, we re biopsy and we test it again for mutations and for, for targets for immune therapy and see if we can redirect our treatment for these patients. Some patients, they get targeted therapy before the operation, and when they relapse their tumor, they are sensitive to immunotherapy, not for target therapy. So sometimes the treatment changes. Sometimes, unfortunately, they have no targeting and no immune, uh, immune uh, uh, predisposition for the treatment, so they go for, for chemotherapy, radiation therapy, the classic way. But unfortunately, Patients relax if you have uh, big tumors, more than four or five centimeters, or metastasis in the lymph nodes. Usually, half of these patients will relapse within two to five, uh, five years. So, and we have to treat them. And then we take one by one to our multidisciplinary board, the board uh, discussions, and we discuss one of them with the pathologist, with the radiologist, with everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yes, please. I think there's another last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so out of time, but uh, okay. do you want to take it? Well, it's up to you. You are, you are the moderator. Uh, do, you, do you want to get a quick question? Is it quick? Yes. yes. Hi, doctor. Thank you so much for the lecture. I wanted to ask about uh, the liquid biopsy. I've been reading that it's been uh, uh, being used in diagnosis and uh, it's being used in diagnosis and in management and in seeing uh, the response to treatment. Where are we now in liquid biopsies in lung cancer, and uh, uh, is it cost effective uh, compared to regular biopsies that are very uh, costly? Uh, to, to, to give you a short question, we are nowhere still. We are, we are not doing this on a routine basis, just for research. So nobody is doing liquid biopsies in lung cancer for routine treatment, just for research. We are not sure what to do with the, with the as I told you, we are, this is a question that we have no answer still. We, we have the technology, we are, we are studying it, we have research, but we, it's not routine yet. Yet. I think it will be there in one or two years. We will be there. I'm sorry, we have no, it's, it has no routine role. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yosef. I want to tell you just some information. Professor Halak is sick. <laughs> so you have, you have to bear with him. He is not feeling well today. So we thank Dr. Halak for his effort, even not feeling that well this morning. Thank you, thank Professor you. Halak. Greetings again. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce our next guest speaker and a renowned scholar in the field of virology. Dr. George Halla completed his medical degree at the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Sao Paulo Medical School in 1989, after which he completed his residency in urology in the same institution. 
Driven by his strive for excellence, he completed a fellowship and a PhD degree in reproductive biology at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio, USA. He went back to Brazil, where he obtained a doctorate in medicine at the Division of Urology in 1999 in the University of Sao Paulo, where he eventually undertook the esteemed position of a full-time professor in 2018. Dr. Halla holds numerous prestigious positions within the clinical and academic setting. Currently, he is the head of sexual medicine and andrology at the Division of Urology in the University of Sao Paulo Medical School Clinical Hospital. He is also the coordinator of the Reproductive Toxicology Unit at the Department of Pathology in the same institution, the coordinator of Men's Health Study Group at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the University of Sao Paulo, a member of the Center for Innovation and a scientific director in the Science and Innovation Center in Andrology and High Complex Clinical and Research Andrology Laboratory in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. George Halla. We eagerly anticipate the wisdom and insights he will impart to us today and thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much to be here. It's a real pleasure to get to the where my to my, my roots in the Uh, you know, the early, in the beginning, okay, you see the Middle East uh, has been for millennia, the beginning of civilization, and I do believe that uh, this uh, uh, brotherhood that we are doing now, will be a key point in the future for our people to regain uh, roots and maybe in the next uh, 30, 50 years, 100 years, the Arabs will be back to where they have always belonged in the evolution of men. Okay? Thank you very much. Don't speak Arabic, but I try to make sure you see this phrase because uh, I'm very honored to be here by uh, speaking to you today by Arab products. Thank you. The evolution of cooperation is very important that we cooperate. In the beginning, we had the competition instead of cooperation. This is primitive. The secret is if you competition with cooperation in the good sense. I saw here I was in the fallback, I was in Hebrews, and I saw many civilizations that came after the other, and they ruined the previous civilization. That's not good. We have to respect our past, our history, and move on from that. So I believe this is new beginning. I run a, uh, uh, besides the university degree, I have a research laboratory, private research laboratory that has many research in domain fertility and men's health, and we do several projects with, uh, basically, we have cooperation with all continents in the world. And I might thank you, the possibility to cooperate with us in my laboratory. Prostate cancer, this I understand this is a lecture for medical students, okay? So you can see here, the incidence of cancer has gone up in the world. In the Middle East, you see the area is red 
or uh, dark yellow, meaning that you have an increase in detection of, of all cancers combined with around 1.1 to 2 percent per year increase. And also, the death rate in the Middle East is higher, so maybe you have to move on this type of meeting to make sure things improve. Okay. Regarding prostate cancer, one every six men will have prostate cancer. It's like habits and lifestyle, like obesity, sedentaries, uh, uh, etc., play a key role in developing cancer, prostate cancer. It's the main cancer in men, number one cancer in men, and uh, in women, of course, is breast cancer, Dr. Morris, you hear people brilliantly after me. So, uh, prostate adenocarcinoma, not all prostate cancers are adenocarcinoma. Some of some are rare carcinoma that are not carcinoma, they're psychomas, but it's too rare. I'm focusing on adenocarcinoma today. Uh, I see the prostate gland the epithelium, that is where it starts the prostate cancer. And there are many, many mechanisms, but I do believe in you know, oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species. That's my main line of research, including cancer and main fertility. You see here that uh, from a start point, infection or ischemia or whatever, you have reactive oxygen species, you have reactive nitrogen species, you have activation of the immunologic system that may disrupt the normal uh, metabolic uh, intracellular environment, microenvironment. And you have a start of uh, any kind of disease, including cancer. Of course, uh, race plays a key role. But the blacks had 50% more, Oriental 70% less, Indians 70% less. And if you have one family member, the odds ratio of getting cancer is increased by 1.5. If you have a two family members, it's three times more. If you have three family members, five times more. So it's very important that you look for your background not just, uh, I would say, two, three generations up, okay? And uh, of course, uh, we have many advantages in prostate cancer than other cancers, because the finger is very uh, powerful and it's still very important tool of diagnosing prostate cancer. And uh, of course, you have uh, the CIPSA. I believe that uh, maybe is the only marker that you can have in your blood that really is very accurate. It's not uh, specific for prostate cancer like I want to see, but it's very accurate. And now with the cutoff has gone down to 2.5, it used to be 4. So we must make a uh, uh, be more careful when the PSA reaches 2.5. And the digital rectal examination, as you can see, uh, the majority of cancers can be detected. 82% are in this region, but you have 18% of prostate cancer that are not detected by digital rectal examination. That's why I need a combination of uh, PSA, uh, digital rectal examination, and probably an, an ultrasound. The biopsy is made uh, inside the rectum to a guided biopsy we have today. Uh, fused guided biopsy when you combine MRI and Doppler ultrasound at the same time. So it's very accurate biopsy. And uh, you, you, we used to do 24 fragments. Now we can go down for less fragments and the accuracy has gone up significantly. So if the PSA level is uh, a known, the normal examination, the abdominal, see, which is less than. 2.5, you still have uh, 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 normal PSA, abnormal, just 25%. If it's beyond 10, the PSA, you have a normal P uh, digital recognition, 95%. So you have to combine both. Uh, of course, today we have multi parametric prostate magnetic resonance imaging, which is very important, like Dr. Professor Douglas showed before me. Uh, it's uh, very important that has gained a lot of, uh, become a common test, huh? common as a mid-machine system you can see here, the nodule. And now we have the PRADS evaluation. That you say PRADS 1 is very low. Even the patient has, let's say, PSC 4, 5, or 6, 
if it's be red one, it will be it will be just uh, uh, maybe what you do instead of once a year looking at the doctor, you can come twice. Uh, PRX2, very low uh, likely, but PRX3, you uh, open your eyes, there is a yellow sign that you have to be careful. PRX4 is a high clinical sequence cancer likely, so you need a biopsy definitely here, PRX4. And PRX5 is uh, not uh, diagnosed because you need a biopsy, but it's very likely. What's important to say is that the prostate cancer raise the PSA uh, by three points for every gram of prostate tissue. Whereas, uh, let's say, an infection, which is very common, that's why the, the digital examination is not just for prostate cancer. It's very important for men who have a subclinical for prostatitis and epididymitis. We have a research line in bacteria in men's health. We have 11,000 samples now after uh, 12 years. It's amazing to see how many infections you have uh, in the male reproductive tract. It's under them. And so if you have prostatitis, the raising PSA will be only 0.3 per gram of prostatic tissue. So like I said, elevated PSA has many. Uh, when I say sexual activity, it depends on type of sexual activity. If you have anal intercourse, for instance, uh, the likelihood for you to have uh, speaking of the microscope is very high, it's beyond 75%. Uh, like I said before, so if you, uh, of course you have a staging, the systemic, bone scan, and the PSA. Uh, but it's very important to say that uh, the prostate cancer related to age, you have a clinical practice showing the, the prostate cancer risk for age uh, and the autopsy. That means that prostate cancer is a disease that uh, in many circumstances will not kill the patient. It's not like lung cancer or uh, gastrointestinal cancer, uh, but it's very important to have uh, preventative measures and to diagnose early. We have the Gleason score, which is very helpful for pathology, like Professor Riyadh said, pathology is very important. Uh, grade 3, grade 4, grade 5 is Gleason. Depends on the differentiation and undifferentiates the cells of the protein. So the Gleason score, let's say you have uh, 50 grade percent grade 3, 40 percent grade A, 1 percent grade 5. This patient score Gleason 3 plus 7 because this is 50, this is 40 percent, so this is 7. So if you have here, uh, the traditional Gleason score means that you have the uh, updated uh, Izuk score. Uh, three plus seven is two, but four plus three is four plus three is still seven, but is Izuk higher because you have a higher percentage percentage of more in indifferentiated cells, more aggressive cells. So here. Like I said before, is of two. And a five year survival for a uh, Gleason score, so you see that it drops considerably. If you have a Gleason score uh, between five or six, it's very high. But you have a Gleason score seven, so seven is a key number in prostate cancer for Gleason score. It's considered aggressive tumor. Staging, you have T1 when the disease is located inside the prostate. T2, when the disease is still deprosted but has not gone beyond the prostate capsule. And you have T3 and T4 when you have not gone beyond the prostate capsule. And you have, uh, of course, M0, M1, and also as important. The prognostic factor uh, also is very important is the staging. You see that it has a big drop when you have uh, T3 and beyond, and you have metastatic uh, prostate cancer. I see with all the, with all the results, everything that you have added in treatment uh, looks like it's, it has improved, but not that much, like 10 to 20 years before. So the key hole in prostate cancer is early detection. You see the PSA levels at the clinical staging, 
goes up. So PC is a very good marker. And of course, you have surgery or radiation therapy. This is the dilemma. Uh, radical prostatectomy, you have uh, uh, 4%, uh, I would say it's 2.5 now. Uh, we are incontinence and 8% tolerable and uh, reply dysfunction. I would say that's around 40 to 50%. Depends on how the erectile function was before the surgery. It's very important that the physician has a nice evaluation on the erectile function before surgery. It's not going to get improved after surgery. And you see that, of course, you have the therapy. Okay. Of course, you have therapy for this. No? Robotic surgery is now uh, in, 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 in urology, robotic surgery, prostate cancer is, uh, has been a uh, move forward. Uh, you have to do that, you just go for the clinical case. Of it. This, this is our patient that's 62 years old. You see that his PSA uh, was 2.5, the prostate was 78 centimeters. Uh, then his PSA went up. And this patient, what's important, he, did, uh, he was divorced and he had to do that, but he wanted to marry her and to have another child. So that's well, what do you do first? Do you run psychiatry or to take care of this desire to have you? We decided to do, to do both. So the biopsy after one year, uh, is on three plus three, is on six. So a patient that uh, even if the cancer is not that bad, but if the patient, uh, wants to have another child is very it's not a good idea if we progress the cancer with a baby so we we did uh uh the way guidelines said that this patient could have uh, active surveillance it's, it's okay for active surveillance but then he had a uh, reason i took uh, one in five percent of the so he decided for a right purpose to but we decided instead of the vasectomy reversal for obvious reasons, we decided to pick our sperm from his epididymis uh, his testicle. So he can do IVF further and have his so desirable child. So these are uh, uh, the, 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 the surgery went very well. And uh, the testicles are here. I just want to show you the case that we took sperm from his uh, epididymis and from his testicle. We found areas. Or where the spermatozoa was uh, there. This was combined with the right prostatectomy, and we freed some sperm from these testicles, and he had a nice baby boy after two years uh, when, when he decided that the cancer was not going to come back. He didn't have to do any more therapy, just the surgery was enough, no radiation therapy because he was little six and uh, T1. So we preserved his semen, and he had a child. I think that's enough. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Fanda? Thank you. Um, Dr. Halak, it was a very nice presentation. The question, when should a man start doing his uh, prevention? Thank you, Robert. That's a very nice, important question. Uh, the recommendation now, if you have uh, any uh, relative with prostate, uh, any parents of relative prostate cancer, you should start by the age of 40. If you don't have, uh, then you should start at age 45. So it's a five year decrease from 50 to 45 and from 45 to 40 years old. Hi, uh, I'm Nancy Shadid from uh, Lebanese American University. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Halat. So thank you so much, especially since you're not feeling that great. And this is a question really more for all the panel. And Dr. Yunus, thank you. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, the new advances, um, the individual, individualized therapy and multidisciplinary. So as you know, we have this these massive problems in Lebanon right now. We have wonderful human resources, we're very smart people, we also have massive problems. And so the, the political and the economic, they unfortunately aggravate each other. For example, we're working with uh, organizations including ILMA, people around the world that want to donate 
equipment costs, with donations. Recently, increased taxes have been placed on the donated materials, so they're not able to get in. It's really uh, a, lot, a lot of trouble going on. And I have members of my extended family, uh, one who had an advanced cancer, which she had a very good physician. She was lucky and she had resources and did very well. Another member of the extended family did not have those advantages and a relatively young man who died of lung cancer. But so I, I can't ask you to help us with all that right now. But what I do think is that we could do is have an approach. Uh, a third example of my extended family is where uh, the patient's oncologist and surgeon have different opinions of what her course should be, and they're not really talking to each other. They go through her, they say, you should do this, and the other one says, oh, you should do that, and they get all these different opinions. So I think that something would not cost anything is this approach of really getting into the mindset of cooperative, cooperating with each other and having multidisciplinary thinking, and the selective treatment individualized which would, could actually save resources. Uh, and I think AI can also place or have a role in helping us to select. So that was, I think, more of a statement than a question. But if you have any thoughts about how we can uh, change that mindset and implement it. Well, uh, thank you for the question. This mindset, I believe, uh, we, are, we are from Latin America. So the mindset uh, also there is uh, terrible. So it's very unusual. For instance, in Brazil, only 48% of men in the whole country have done one digital health examination in the lifetime, just 48%. Some states that goes up to 75%. Like that. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, education. I believe in education and health. We focus a lot on drugs, alcohol, and like we're going to see later today. We have uh, educational programs for, for schools and that, my opinion we have decided to move forward to teach adolescents and young adults i believe that's a good point because after thinking a lot we have uh, also other issues that uh, are of concern like uh, too much uh, assisted product technology being used without uh, medical uh, diagnosis and you have also the problems with alcohol and drugs in Brazil with marijuana and electronic cigars. Like I was here in Lebanon, we went to the two uh, nightclubs and I was surprised by uh, seeing that uh, over 50% of people are using electronic cigars, especially women, which is uh, according to the latest results, women are smoking more than men. And I believe that we have to focus on the adolescents and young adults. That may be change, right? Life, that may be a change you're making for the future. So, in, in that point, we have uh, several online courses that I can offer to you and to your students. The students, uh, they, they, they can they start, they don't need to be there, just uh, look in the internet. I'll be pleased to help. And I think I, I would like to, uh, to add uh, for, for the, the part that I think that you look at me and uh, uh, it's very important and in a country like, with all the respect, a country like Lebanon, with all the crisis that you have, you have to optimize what you have before trying to get more technology. So, uh, multidisciplinary tumor boards is not a luxury nowadays. This is the way we select. So, if you don't have this, if people don't talk to each other, the specialists, uh, I think you you will you will spend a lot of money for not for for futile treatments. Uh, in a country like Brazil and Lebanon, uh, we have uh, limited resources. If we don't use them well before we get new resources, I think we, we are going to lose a lot of patients. You are absolutely right. It's, it's unbelievable. How can we uh, not be in sync in treating our patients uh, the best way possible? So we have to, to do our best to get anywhere in the country multidisciplinary decision, second opinions, very active second opinions, and prevention. Uh, we, we can treat them, it's very expensive, we prevent them. So here in this country, most of the people who smoke, which is unbelievable, they don't have money to treat the disease. So prevention is very good, education is very excellent, and in treating cancer, multidisciplinary approach is the only approach possible for 
not only for rich countries, more than so for uh, limited resource countries. I, I, you are absolutely right. Okay, I think that now we have a a topic. Thank you, Professor Hamad. Thank you. A topic here, and we will have to be back eleven nine because eleven ten we start. Hey everyone, just uh, let's divide. Let everybody go together very fast upwards. The young people.
you may ask why to all of us related to cancer. Well, because cancer as cardiovascular surgery, uh, cardiovascular diseases are the main ones in the <clears throat> most developed countries. Infectious disease have been uh, controlled in most parts of the world. And people is getting older. So that's why these two diseases are really very important. We're gonna have tomorrow a uh, session on uh, cardiac problems. Uh, but today, two sessions on, <clears throat> on cancer. And to start the second model, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Mauricio Magallanes Costa. He's from Rio de Janeiro. Well, he's a professor of surgery at Rio de Janeiro. He is not a Lebanese descendant, right, Mauricio? Yeah. But he was very enthusiastic to join us in this uh, activity to start this conference. So I'll thank you uh, twice, Mauricio, one, to be here, a second one, so without being a level interested letter, now you're becoming an honorary one. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, 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 and I had a very good relationship with his family, and I, I admire very much. And it's a pleasure, and I really thank you, Professor Hal Knight, for this invitation, and Professor Madrid, and also the others for this kind of invitation. It's a great pleasure, and of course, whatever I can help you in this fantastic project to join with you, but of course, I will ready to help you. What I will talk in the next 15 minutes about breast cancer is a global health problem. And uh, I will give general principles on how we manage it and where I go in this direction. This is, of course, it's a, a fiction. We, we never have the, all the whole time, all the words in the dark, but this is showing. This is a, the Earth's going space showing these bright areas are where we have more electric factors. And then we all, all of us we know that there's a relationship between development and the use of electric objects. And then if you look at this, you see the areas in the, the more developed, like the east of the United States, Europe, some parts of America, South of Africa part of Asia, and there is a very interesting relationship between the incidence of cancer, most of the cancers, and this area of development. That's in some way development is related to the incidence of cancer in general. And breast cancer, especially the prostate, are very similar in the aspects that they can contribute to all this appearance of the disease. And it's becoming a global health problem, as, as you can see. It's a second country global health problem, affecting millions of people worldwide. It's the most common diagnosed cancer in women worldwide, with an estimated 2.3 million new cases that go to 2020. It's too much. And this is increasing also in lower and middle income countries. This was a disease for more developed countries, but nowadays, even in lower and middle income countries, we have very high incidence. And in Lebanon, the same epidemiological profiles apply where breast cancer is leading cancer among the women's debates, present almost 40% of all cancer cases. That means it's very frequent. We probably, whatever which specialty we do, we will see cancer, especially in our society, because it's very important. 
not only is high incidence, but also because the uh, women are there. As, as you know, more and more, the women are the center of the family, to take care of the child, children, who organize the family. Then any disease that affects the woman, especially that we have more and more new cases in young women, this is a very social problem because the, the rupture of the family and the orphans, then it's really a very serious problem that we are really concerned about this. And in Lima, especially in the Middle East, this is of breast cancer is higher than any other Middle East country. This was surprised when I did it with you that the incidence here is increasing. And it's because at a younger age, as I said, that women in Western countries and more aggressive than other. It's not very clear why, but this is what the numbers are showing. The Lebanese women had higher risk factor for developed breast cancer and had less knowledge of the benefits of breast cancer screening tools, calling for the importance of promoting health lifestyles and education, as Professor Alakis told in the first presentation. Education and health is very important. It's expensive. The, the, the lifestyle to make you uh, to get new habits to have a better and uh, health life in general. And this is for all reasons, but it also in breast cancer. When you study the effect of that influence, this instance of breast cancer, is, the family history is very important to have a case in the family, especially breast cancer, ovary cancer, in young women less than 50 years, it's very, you should be aware that perhaps there is a genetic predisposition in the family. Now it's very well established that it's a hereditary ovary breast cancer. And some genes are very well defined related to the appearance. And these are extent that are very more and more easy to do and to find families where we have that we can identify this pathogenic mutation where we can have a special kind of screening for this. Increasing use of hormone replacement therapy. This is another factor that's related. Hormone replacement therapy is a good uh, tool. We should use it, but we should use it very carefully under serious medical control. Uh, higher prevalence of obesity, bad diet, this is probably Today, in the afternoon, we'll have a discussion about this. This is the base of many diseases, and also cancer, especially breast cancer, relates to the overweight. Very German art that we were identifying more and more the women are getting over the art, and uh, the delay of first pregnancy of or with parity. This is another aspect of our new society here in our country. But we see that women have get the children older and less children, and this make probably this is at, at least epidemiologically it's related as to push the older the women have get the children, higher risk they have for breast cancer. There are many reasons for this. I think it's not in the scope of this presentation, but this is a reality. And a great alcohol consumption. It's called the relate to breast cancer, uh, aging, of course, and is activity. To have a good, uh, uh, good habits will help to, to prevent or to avoid cases. And uh, although the, the incident rates of breast cancer are still low in the Middle East, such that in the Western ones, mortality rates are similar at that time, even higher. It's estimated that 30% of breast cancer are due to environment and lifestyle factors, such as obesity, diet, and hence can be prevented. The Middle East suffered from such a new rate of, of obesity, with the uh, age of the country ranking among the highest worldwide in obesity, regardless among, among the adults, age uh, in the older. This was a surprise for me because I all had the idea of the disease of a diet, it's very healthy. But probably here in Lebanon, where 
perhaps you have the, the answer for this better than me, that uh, it's changing because uh, the people that's not good, uh, they are not following this particular diet. They are eating more processed food, more gentle, and of course, this relates to medicine. And of course, we have to face many problems. And this question that even the, the, the incidence is not so high, the, the mortality high, that's that you are not have access to swimming and not for all that goes of course for your treatment. And then I will present one case and then we will discuss better these aspects. This is a patient of 48 years old. She has felt a one centimeter lump in the left breast. Her first one was overweight and reverse without previous clinical or image examination that we can see. With, with uh, 48 years, uh, love, she has a self examination, she has overweight and uh, lofty disproductivity, high risk, and with the family positive, very high risk. And uh, uh, she said she was in this group. And the diagnosis of this is mammography and ultrasound. You did it, and you identified. So we fill up by right spike that means this is a classification where we see how the patient is and this five by red spike is sufficient as high feature that we should be to the middle of biopsy. We used here you can see the ultrasound with the device with the needle where we have the core biopsy. You can see here the needle entering that you need the lump. And you have diagnosis of, uh, of breast cancer. Well, at this moment, what uh, Professor Kiyazi has presented is very really important. The integration is not a decision of the surgeon. You should have the multidisciplinary, what we call interdisciplinary, where we discuss in the dual world how to approach this patient. It is the, because it's not only the surgeon, it's the breast. As you can see here, when I started my career, how could I to remember this very well? This was all the patients, <laughs> mastectomy. You can imagine what women in any situation have this kind of surgery with a terrible mutilation. This was forced, this was delaying the, as the women they do, if they had a breast cancer, I will lose, I will lose, I will lose my, my breast. And then, we, which are, and nowadays, most of them are treated like this with oncoplastic surgery. You can see here the different approach, depends on the organization of the lung. We have different approach to have a fantastic result. And then we should discuss in the two words if this is an approach for a surgery up front or to do kind of treatment with uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy. Or therapy in a cluster is a new adjuvant and then improve the condition for a better surgical result. And this is an example, as you can see, in the modern surgery, we take only one piece and we mark this lesion. Nowadays, fortunately, also this is we will do a, a good program of screening, detect images that are unpalpable, and then we put a mark. To identify the lesion, then we do the surgery, taking only the area, uh, excision, a partial excision, and like you said, the the liver node. That's very important because the cancer you have it local, you may have it regional, when the lymph nodes are compromised and you have it systemic when you have metastasis. Of course, you try to get the diagnosis as early as possible, especially in a local moment. In a, Asymptomatic. This is the idea. And then, if you have it, you need to study the lymph node to see. And nowadays, I, this surgery that I have shown before is hospital surgery. We take out all the lymph nodes. I remember the mean 34 lymph nodes. This is absolutely out of question nowadays. We study only the one lymph node that, of course, is much better for the. Static results, you can see a final 
result of a surgery of breast cancer nowadays and without uh, defects in the upper arm because of uh, the risk of leaving the organs. And also, with all these plastic uh, approach that we have nowadays, it is the pain of uh, different uh, tools that we have where we can prove these results and have a very good even if you have a tumor in a different location or if it's a uh, mood uh, centric you can have uh, this plastic and not only with the flaps but also with the reconstruction where we can use uh, implants you can use the matrix many implants expanders uh, flaps and also the flat uh, action that allows better very good results and also the radio therapy we have a, a fantastic progress i remember when we started how that was cobalt with many effects and it worked in the patients nowadays this new technique that we we give the high dose a very specific place protect the risk you can breathe and then you avoid the risk of cardiac risk of the radiation that's really very safe and what we said before this interdisciplinary is very important we have many arms as you can see many tools the surgery radiotherapy hormone chemotherapy and the type of therapy like has presented before nowadays this is the big challenge uh, fantastic, especially because it's not only the diagnosis of cancer or not, which cancer we have. What are the characteristics of breast cancer? We, we classify in four types the aluminum, the AMB, the triple negative, and the virtue positive. In the face of this classification, it can be predicted the results and really personalize the treatment of the patient. Then we have some reflections my presentation. The development of an expensive but accurate the approach to diagnosis as a is clinical need for regions in the world. We need to know exactly what we have. Like I said before today, we should improve the condition that we have. The port to report new technology, try to do our best to the building we can get very good results and identify the best way to treat the patient. Cost effective drug and many anti cancer drugs require identification of molecular subsets of breast cancer and what the uh, PR sold to the coach If we share this risk with the pharmaceutical company, they are partners in this. The, their message that they are trying to improve the result of the patient and help us to really use it for the patient that really needs. In Brazil, many of the pharmaceutical companies. They pay for the diagnosis tests. And then I think you should be, and perhaps I can guide you with all this, how we can improve this situation. Early diagnosis and treatment was 